Welcome to Control Your Career, a podcast to help you conquer uncertainty, shatter imposter syndrome, and rise above the expectations imposed by others. My name is Julia Toothaker, and I am the career coach and strategist at Ride the Tide Collective, my career development company where I offer career coaching courses, and I have a plethora of free content. I have been doing this work for over a decade, and I want to help empower professionals like you to find clarity, navigate your current career with finesse, and propel yourself toward career advancement in alignment with your unique personality, preferences, and values. This podcast is a great place to start your journey toward controlling your career. Season 10 is all about managers and specifically what managers want and expect from their employees and teams. I've brought on people managers with at least 10 years of experience managing who are also currently managers to help you understand their mindset and expectations. Each episode will have action items that you can apply to your unique situation and consider in your relationship with your manager. You can find this episode and more at ridethetidecollective.com. And you can connect with me on LinkedIn, where I post career information and inspiration to help you control your career. Welcome, everyone. We are back for another episode for the manager's perspective. And I am very excited to have Meredith Allen here. She has such an amazing history. She's had so many wonderful companies that she's worked for. And currently she is the head of customer success at Scribble. And I I just want to like jump in (laughs) with you, Meredith, and have you talk a little bit about your history and how you got to where you're at. Because you have worked for some very prominent company. So why don't you give us a little introduction? Yeah, for sure. Thanks for having me. This is awesome. I, you know, who doesn't like to talk about themselves for a few minutes? Uh, So yeah, my journey in education, well, if we go way back, it's in middle school when I had the chance to to step in and, and teach some littler students. And I had that whole light bulb pop on like, okay, this feels like I like helping people in the classroom. So I knew way back that I wanted to be in education. Uh, fast forward, I went through college. I was good at music. I liked music. So naturally I was a music educator. That was the route I went. And I did successfully and happily teach for nine years in a classroom in rural Iowa, uh, instrumental music band. I held the band program there and loved it. Uh, unfortunately, writing on the wall kind of showed me that that school was going to be consolidating and my position would eventually be kind of mishmashed into many different. And so I, I started looking around. I was like, well, I'm good at technology. There's another position down down the road that's a instructional technology consultant at like an AEA, which is like a state agency uh, in Iowa that mm-hmm. serves many different school districts. And so I, I decided to throw my hat in at that at that juncture and and. I got the position and it was honestly one of those moments where I was like, well, I guess I'm going to fake it till I make it because I'm a music educator and here now I'm going to have to uh, help other teachers with technology in in like an official capacity where it was always unofficial before. And I did have my master's in in technology and training, but I just never had a position, uh, you know, up until that point. So I was like, Mm -hmm. okay, I guess we're going to do that. And I, I did that for two years. And again, I loved it. I had a great team that I worked for. It was at Prairie Lakes in, in the middle of Iowa, uh, served 47 school districts, learned a ton. And I think that was my first lesson in, in, in and I, I use like growth mindset. I know that's like a, a loaded buzz term, but it's like definitely one of those things where, where you, you rise to the occasion, you rise to the challenge and you learn so much more. And so I definitely have honored that time and, and, and tried to replicate it in as many times as I could in other areas since then. But, um, again, during that time, I, I fell in love with a music tool, uh, that I was sharing with music educators that I actually didn't have in the classroom. It was called Soundtrap. It was an online recording studio. And I was I didn't know about it while I was teaching. And then I learned about it when I was consulting in the in the tech classroom. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. I reached out to the company. Long story short, they loved me. I loved them. I started working for them. Uh, it was a Swedish startup in, in Stockholm. Uh, 
and I, I actually had both jobs for, for some time where I was doing like weekend gigs where they would fly me to a, a, a Google summit or they, they'd fly me to FETC down in Florida and I would do that. And then I come up and I do my consulting work and I was like, okay, I can only do one of these now. So I leaned in and I was like, I'm going to work for this Swedish startup. I, it's, it's against everything as far as like security at that point. They, they even, you know, I was a first U.S. employee. And, and, you know, there's a lot of roadblocks that come in with, with just the logistics of that, but it mm -hmm. felt right. And I knew with my previous experience, like, okay, if, if it feels right and, and it's going to be new and exciting and you're passionate about it, it's probably going to be okay. And it did, it was fantastic. And that was 2015. I ended up working for that company officially for seven years, but during the seven years, it was acquired by uh, Spotify. Spotify had identified it as, uh, you know, an up and coming music tool that they were very interested in. And so during those seven years of working at Soundtrap, I held a lot of positions. I essentially worked my way up, uh, starting as like an evangelist, an ambassador, account manager, salesperson. And then I held interim roles for, for people that were on paternity leaves. And then they, you know, then I was um, interim head of marketing because we didn't have a marketing person. Then I was head of customer success. And then I moved over to research ops just because I wanted something new for a while. Um, and so it, it's just like, if somebody looks at my resume, they'd be like, why do you have so many roles at this company within seven, seven years? But again, we were building the plane as we flew it. So you have to adapt. And uh, unfortunately, uh, Spotify unacquired us in, in June of, of last year of 22. So I had this opportunity where I could stay and go back. I could stay with Soundtrap. They were going to go back to their startup origins, not really change much, except no longer have corporate benefits in the, in the corporate title of Spotify behind them. Or I could try something new. And I knew that I had done the startup at Soundtrap and I'd gotten, you know, we'd, we'd done that once. And I was like, well, I know that new and exciting things are usually good growing uh, opportunities for me. And so I um, I quit my job and decided to see what was out there. And um, two weeks later, I was hired at another company. And, and that's Scribble. That's where I'm at today. Um, through a friend of mine, we had, a, you know, the network and he, he kind of snatched me up, which was awesome. Cause I feel like, uh, he, he might feel like I'm doing the company a favor, but I feel like he was doing me a favor and, and it's been like a wild ride, um, helping scale up that company over the last six or so months. And so I'm head of customer success at Scribble. Now you wouldn't think that a music teacher from rural Iowa would ever be in this position at this point, but that's the story. <laughs> I love this. And okay, I, I'm going to take a, a little turn right now because this, <laughs> this season's really about managing and we'll talk about that. Yep. But I think that just hearing your career path is so important for so many people to understand that one, you never know the, the shifts that you're going to make and where you're going to end up. Number two, I know that I, I have a lot of educators in my um, network and in my sphere, and educators are one of those populations where I think they have so many transferable skills that they don't even realize that they have to go into other, you know, other areas. And I think this is a really great example of that. Not only that, I talk a lot about, you know, making a shift that's adjacent to the industry that you're in. So being in education and then shifting to working with educators and then shifting to working for a product that serves educators, it might seem all disjointed, but it's really not. It really is all connected and part of the journey. And I and I want to highlight that because I think that people need to understand that it there's always some kind of connection. It's not always this, you know, oh, I just started this brand new thing, brand new industry, brand new function, brand new everything. There's usually something there that's already guiding you in something that you have done previously. And I think that your career path is the perfect example for that. So I appreciate you sharing that. I think a lot of people are going to find value in here in hearing that path. So thank you so much. Yeah, no problem. Okay, so let's let's talk about management. Right? Let's yeah. talk about people management. So overall, how would you describe your people management style and how do you think it's evolved over the years? Cuz I know kind of working with 
educators and teachers is going to look a little bit different than working in a startup environment. So how has that shifted? What does that look like for you? Yeah, for sure. And I think what you'd said about the transferable skills is like, right, you're hitting it on the head because as a teacher, you have to manage people. It's you manage kiddos, you, you manage your colleagues, you manage your administration. It's not an official management position per se, but it definitely is something that you have to learn how to do and, and uh, influence. I think that's another um, word that again, is kind of a little loaded, like an influencer. I would not, not ever say I'm an influencer, but to have skills that allow you to influence people's decisions, you know, in a good way. That's not in, not in a in a bad way, but like making sure they that you built a relationship with them and then you give them the information they need to make the decision. And yeah, sure, you have a you you may have an end goal in sight, but it's usually for for good. Um, so I would say my management style or or experience came from the classroom with what I learned from students, parents, and administrators and colleagues. Um, and it's definitely evolved since I officially had to manage people. And I did have kind of a little bit, well, a, a good deer in headlights moment when I had that first manager hat on that was like, okay, you are a manager, you have direct reports. And I was, I think I, I think I probably put too much importance early on, on that fact. I, it, it, it ended up happening more natural. And once it happened more natural, then it was more successful. I think I was a little bit stodgy at the beginning of by, like having a process or 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 whatnot. Um, I was also trying on a lot of different management styles that I had seen and heard and felt mm. before from other managers. And I had, like most people, you've had good managers and you've had not great managers. And so even a few bad habits I had to, to kind of break. Um, but I think that there's generally two rules that I have always adapted to any management situation that I've had since I've been in, in business. And that's, and I, and I had them in the classroom. I didn't really understand I had them in the classroom, but now there are two rules that I follow. And, and the first one is I try to remove as many roadblocks for my team as possible for them to do their work. I want to make sure that my job, I take some of that brunt so that they can keep moving and grooving. And, and the second rule is make sure they feel supported hundred percent of the time. Even if I don't necessarily agree with something that they're doing, I need to have them come to the realization that it's maybe not a great idea through through their point of thought or maybe change my mind, but I don't want them to know that I don't support them in that moment. I want them to make sure that they feel supported until they can come to the next realization on what works for said project. Um, and honestly, it, honestly, those two rules kind of, it's a simple, but it works because it, it also like allows for a really good relationship building. Um, I, I don't, my, you know, I don't micromanage. I, I just try to be supportive and loving. Yeah. Oh my gosh. I love that. And I have to point out too, the rules, you know, quote unquote rules, they're for you. They're for me. They're 100%. not for the team. Right. I think that's well, such a good distinction to make, especially, you know, for any employees who are listening to this or honestly, any other managers that are listening to this. You have expectations for yourself of how you're going to work with your team versus looking at your team and going, I need you to be this way. I need you to work this way. I need you to do it like right. this, which yep. doesn't work in the classroom with kids and it doesn't work with adults and professionals either. Right. And that's, so it's I, so funny that you say that because a lot of people think that the way you teach students is different than the way you teach adults. And it's not. You it, Teachers don't want to sit through three hours of professional development being talked at, just like little kids don't want to spend three hours being talked at. Like it doesn't change from the age. So I yeah. love that you said that. Yeah, no, I think that's great. And I think too, you said something kind of early in your management, um, early in your people management, you had to unlearn some things and unlearn some habits. And I think that's so important. I We talked about this on another interview. Managers are people too. And I think you're going to hear me say this a lot throughout this season, because I think it's important to realize that, especially if you have somebody who is a new manager, like, yes, there needs to be some expectations of how they treat people and all of that, but also recognize that they are learning and they are trying to, you know, own their style. And again, they're taking from what they've seen and trying to figure out what works and what doesn't work and all of that. And so I appreciate you saying that because I think sometimes we need a reminder of, hey, I, I recognized that this didn't work out well 
or this style or this way of saying something and I had to adjust and fix that, right? And so I think that's so important for people to hear. Yep, 100%. I appreciate the grace that my early employees gave me while I tried on some different different hats of management styles. Yeah, and I think too, like that transparency with that first team to say, hey, I'm a new manager, like work with me here, give me feedback, you know, let's work on this together because I want to be a good manager for you, but I also have to understand what's going to work best for me. And I think some people are afraid of that transparency, but if you have the right team around you, they'll embrace it and everybody can work well together. (laughs) Hey there, Julia here. Is this episode resonating with you? Maybe it's got you questioning how you can better communicate with your manager, team, or just learn more about how to control your career. Well, I've busted into this episode to tell you about my career action coaching. Career coaching is more than job search and resumes. It's also about managing the day-to-day situations that come up in your career. This coaching option is perfect for the career management situations that you're dealing with, along with other career-related challenges or goals. This is a flexible coaching option to help tackle specific topics to move forward efficiently and confidently. Not all coaching requires a six-month commitment. Career Action Coaching is three hour-long sessions that can be customized to your unique needs. Before committing, let's discuss what you need in my complimentary Career Coaching Clarity Call. The link will be in the show notes and the description for this episode. Now let's get back to the show. Okay, let's talk about hiring because I feel like this is this is such a, a big topic pretty much all the time. I think it's a little bit heightened right now. But when you're hiring somebody, I'm going to get a little bit into the weeds because I think this is what people want to hear from managers specifically. When you are hiring somebody, what are you looking for on the resume? What are you looking for in the interview process? Like, What are things that stand out to you? Yeah, so as far as resumes go, that's so tough for me personally, uh, because I see this piece of paper. I want to, I want to hire every single person I generally get on that, on that pile of resumes. And for one, my experience with this was that, you know, er, first experience in hiring was we were part of the Spotify ecosystem. So our resumes were top notch. We got, we would open up that job rack and it would be closed within 24 hours and we would have 500 amazing resumes to go through. So I did have that. And so I would say, Probably the most best impact would be if your network, if you can get in the right pile of resumes, because I know a lot of companies have where you have internal referrals because you Mm -hmm. know somebody and that goes in a different pile. And honestly, that pile gets more eyes on it generally. And so I think for resumes, that's just, I mean, I don't have like a great rule of like, oh, include your picture or make sure that it's only on one page or anything like that. It's just, if you have any internal connections to that company, try to leverage them because I think it will get you more eyes. Like I said, as far as interviewing, I think, um, probably I look for authenticity, uh, with people like having a conversation like you and I are having, and I'll try to kind of set the stage and, and allow for that safe space with some kind of icebreaker. Like what's your favorite superpower or like, even I'll share something embarrassing. Like I'll be like, oh my gosh, my daughter just ran naked behind me. Did you see that? And then they know that like, okay, she's a real person. She's willing to have her like arena open for all the the good juju to come through. And 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 then I kind of gauge how authentic, how much are they giving me back? Um, because I don't think we're gonna get much work done if we hire if I hire someone, if they feel like they need to have that block or that barrier or that that layer of um, yeah, just that block up. Uh, yeah. And then the, the second one would be, um, I go back to growth mindset again, but it's, it's, are, are they sharing examples of when they've made mistakes or miscalculations and how they've learned from those and how they've applied it to the next iteration of whatever they had in their, in their past. And, and that's really how coachable is the person. And, and I really, I look for that during interviewing and, and it's, it's, it, and again, I think that kind of also goes back into the authenticity is like, it's not, I'm not fake. I, I'm, I'm a, a human. I make mistakes, but this is how I made it. And this is how I learned from it. Um, yeah. So those are probably what I would mention there. 
Yeah, I love that. Okay, for the interviewing, I think that's so important for people to understand. You know, one of the pieces of advice that I've given to people before is interview like you don't need it because you will be so much more comfortable with yourself and more authentic. You know, and I and I'm all for practicing, you know, have the stories, have all of that stuff prepared. You absolutely need to do that. But when you sound robotic Mm -hmm. because you've practiced so much, that's what makes it hard when you're on the other side, right? Because it's like, am I getting the real you or am I getting this practiced and rehearsed version of you? And so I think it's, I, I love that you said that, you know, having that authenticity, have a conversation, don't get caught up you know, in the structure of everything necessarily. Because if you have your stories, they'll come out naturally and you'll be able to say them in a way that makes sense for the person on the other side, you know? Yep. Um, definitely. The other thing, I, I have to point this out for the resumes because I think we're seeing this a lot right now. You you talked about getting 500 applications of quality, like really good candidates within 24 hours. I think for companies that are very well-known like Spotify, that's very common. And we're seeing that right now. The competition is insane. And I think that's something that people just have to understand, (laughs) that you're not necessarily doing anything wrong in your job search or in your application. There's just a lot of competition, you know, and people talk about like networking and it's like, why should I have to network? There's an application. Why can't I just apply for it? For this reason. This is why. Because it's not just an application. It's you against 500 other people who look exactly like you on paper. And so how do you make that distinction? And I've had other guests on that have talked about prioritizing the internal referrals as well. Like those have to go straight to the top in some companies. They get responded to first you know, all of that. And so I think any organization that has that type of referral system, if you're not making use of it, you're likely potentially not going to be in the right pile, as you said. And so I appreciate you saying that so that people understand, you know, what that looks like from the other side. It can be extremely overwhelming to have 500 applications to look at, you know. So this leads really well into my next question, (laughs) Which is, if you have two similar candidates, and I think that we're seeing this again, like this has been very common over the last couple of years. If you have two very similar candidates, what are you looking for? How are you distinguishing between um, two people that look very, very similar? So I generally don't decide. I bring in somebody else to decide for me. And so what I'll do is I will, it, you know, at Soundtrap and Spotify, we I had teams that I could leverage. I had the sales team, I had the CS team, I had a marketing team. And so I could, I, I could handpick a couple of people and say, hey, do you mind sitting in on a second interview for these three people? I, I, they're, they're all pretty top ca- candidates. And I wouldn't always, I wouldn't get one, I would get like two or three. And then they would give me back their own separate feedback for those. And then mm-hmm. I would take that information and then weigh it against my initial thought and how they performed in the second interview and then make a decision because I'm, I'm biased. Everyone is biased in their way. I mean, it's just in different ways and it's just humanity. And I think, um, it's, and if you have trusted colleagues or people that you can leverage in that situation that you know, are looking for the same types of things and understand the situation, use them. They're, super valuable. And if they're willing to give that time, do it. Yeah, I love that. I I love that you're bringing in other people. And I think too, for people who are in a longer interview process where they're like, I've had to meet with this team and I've had to meet with this person. Not that I think it should be more than a couple of interviews, but when you get to that extent, sometimes this is why. Mm -hmm. right? Because they can't make a decision. (laughs) You know, they're trying to choose between so many wonderful candidates and you're, they're trying to get consensus across multiple teams in order to find the right person. So yes, there are interview processes that are absolutely bananas, but in some cases, especially if it gets added and you didn't know about it, that's likely what is going on is they're trying to make a decision from a pool of really great candidates. So I love that you said that to, again, just give that perspective 
of what you have to go through. Sometimes it's not the manager that makes the decision. It's a team of people that are coming together to help support them in that. Yep. Yep. Yeah. All right. So let's get into now, you you know, you have your team, you have your people. Let's talk about one-on-ones. I think this is such a common conversation that I know I have with my clients in terms of like, what am I supposed to do? <laughs> how do? How do we manage one-on-ones, you know, as an employee, as a manager? So what do one-on-ones look like for you? Like, what is that frequency? How do you conduct them? What does it look like? So I think the biggest thing at the beginning is frequency. You're going to want to have more one-on-ones early on of a hire or a new relationship between a manager and an employee because you're establishing the routines and the relationship and you want to be available and go back to going back to those two rules I have. You want to make sure that they're feeling supported and that you're removing all the roadblocks. And you don't know what those are when you're first out of the gate with hiring them. So you need to meet up more often. So I think that's one really important rule. Then you can kind of taper off and go, you know, weekly or biweekly, however it works with how many reports you have. Um, But then the time that you have with them, I've always treated it as equal time. I'm Mm. not coming at that one-on-one with an agenda only. I'm expecting both of us to have agenda items and it's a very collaborative situation. And so how we do that is um, usually I have a running note doc, only one doc, and it's just keep adding to the top, date it so you know which day you're talking about. And then we we both equally put in the items so that we can follow up, take notes, ping each other on it later. And 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 that seems to be, you know, it's safe. It's a low, low ramp up mm-hmm. um, for both of us. And then um, I think the other thing is we might not get to the agenda until halfway through our time because we're talking about whatever personal things that we need to talk about. Because, and this happened a lot during COVID. I remember, you know, cause I was managing a group of about 14 people and then the pandemic hit and it was like, okay, we, we don't need to talk about work right now. We need to talk about how we're feeling. We need to talk about yeah. what's happening and, and work will come later. Like that's, the human is in front of you. The work is secondary at those moments in time. Mm-hmm. Sometimes that's longer given the week. Sometimes it's shorter. And so I think definitely make sure you're weighing the personal need and the professional need during those one-on-one times. Um, yeah. That would- I love that. I love that. And I think too, you know, I, I have some employees who want that personal connection and some who don't. Right. And so there's also like a respect of how much that employee is willing to share and give of themselves in the workplace, you know, respecting that boundary for them as well. Um, and I, I feel like people don't talk about that too much, you know, like it's, I think it's those soft skills that we sometimes forget. And it's, you know, it's important to remember that the manager's a human, the employee's a human. And mm-hmm. yeah. Yep. Yeah. I love to, you know, you you brought up keeping the the document of things to add to the agenda. I think this is a really good conversation around systems for one-on-ones and I think for management in general. I think some managers are great at having a system like that and something that works for everybody. Other managers don't do that and that's absolutely fine, but I think, you know, as an employee, you have to have some kind of system for yourself, even if the manager isn't necessarily engaged in that. And it can be something that you share with them, but it doesn't have to be. Uh, But I think sometimes we don't really, like, we don't address the tracking of things depending on the environment that you're in. Some companies are very good at that, but others, it's, you know, the wild, wild west when it comes to tracking tasks. (laughs) So I think as an employee, you know, have that for yourself, have a place where you're keeping track of things that you can bring to the table and share if your manager isn't already, you know, providing that type of structure for you. I think that's really important. Yep. Yep. hundred percent. Yeah. Okay. Let's talk about hips. I think this is such an interesting conversation. To, I know your face. <laughs> I know. And I, when I was building out this season, I was like, do I want to go there? And and I do. And it's because I think that people have to understand the mindset of managers to get to that 
point, right? So talk to me about PIPs. Those are performance improvement plans. Some companies have different names for them. Um, but what what is an employee doing to get to that point? Like, can they recover from it? Like, what? where are they at once they've gotten there? Uh, yeah, like, can I was first going to say, can we just skip this one? But I know we'll talk about it. Um, I think... I, <sighs> And this might be a little controversial. I don't know, but I I kind of believe that if they've got if an employee has gotten to the point of a performance improvement plan, the manager hasn't done their job right. And I, I, I mean, and the reason I say that, I'll I'll explain like my thinking behind that. And you could totally disagree with me, or anybody listening can totally like throw me under the bus here with a different example. I get it. This is just one person's you know kind of take on it, but. I think managing, if you think of managing as coaching instead of managing, that's a huge, like, it's it's just a mind flip of thinking, like, you're not managing a person. You are, or their work, you are facilitating their growth as an employee. You're, you're, you're giving them tips and tricks and supports and how to be better. And so I think early on during the one-on-one syncs, uh, you identify these areas of improvement unofficially there's no plan in place you as a manager have identified them you are transparent it's tough it's so tough to tell people things that are are that they could do better at or or what you think they could do better at or what you know Mm -hmm. all of that and i think you need to make sure you document that in a in a Mm -hmm. safe space again in that one-on-one doc so that they have the same information that you do and and because the last thing you want to do is surprise them at the end with, with documentation that you've been taking. That just is gross to me. Like wh- yeah. that's a get- gotcha mentality. And so if you're identifying those in, in early on, you're transparent, you're doc- documenting them through the one-on-one shared doc, you're asking the hard questions um, and you're giving them that feedback. I just feel like if, if the employees is not responding the way that you want then you coach them out of the job. Like you coach them to a different place in the company. You coach them to a different team. It's it, apparently this role with you is not the place for them. And so it's not that you have to get to the point where you like hit banging your head against the wall because they just won't do it. No, you start the conversation on like, okay, th- you know, I've given you feedback about this. It's, you know, you haven't done it. What doesn't work for you? And then you have that mm-hmm. conversation and they say, well, actually, I don't really like the work. And then it's like, oh, okay, now we're really getting to the root of why you're not doing X, Y, and Z or you're doing X, Y, and Z. Um, and so I think it's just about that coaching conversation and, and the right fit um, so it doesn't fester into that performance improvement plan. Okay, I, I love this. And I don't think that it's controversial. I know I made it sound like that initially. <laughs> I really don't think it's controversial. I think that this is about accountability and ownership. And I, t- I talk about this so much on social media because we, so many companies are putting all of these like ridiculous, you know, guidelines and things in place for people. And it has nothing to do with accountability. And I think that what you're talking about is managing with accountability, managing with grace, understanding your people, but also the employee has to, to come up in that as well. They have to acknowledge that something's not right. They have to be able to say, yeah, I don't like this or this isn't working for me. But I feel like those conversations happen in a trusted relationship. And so if you're a manager and your employee is not responding well, then there's, then to me, again, as a manager, like there's something missing there. There's a trust piece that has not been built with that person And so now they're not going to give you the right information because likely they could be afraid of getting fired. They could have past experiences of being vulnerable and it not going well. Like there are so many things that come into this, but I love that you're talking about management as coaching because I think that that's really where management has been heading and is continuing to go because Again, we're all human. And I think that that's going to be like the theme for this season. Like we are all human and we need to treat each other as such. 
But I, I, I do appreciate that so much because I think um, there are companies and managers where the pips become this like surprise thing. And it really just shouldn't be that way. And I think that's where like there's an onus on the manager and on the employee to have that communication together. And boo on companies that use it that way because that that is what creates the anxiety and the toxic environments. And honestly, it creates workplace trauma for people Mm -hmm. that then gets transferred to other companies and other positions. And it's just like this terrible process. So I I appreciate you bringing that up and kind of talking about that on both sides. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And I think also um, the, once you cross that bridge into PIP land, you're not going to be able to come back. I, I, as an employee, it's even if they quote unquote have it coming or whatever, mm-hmm. that relationship is now going to be basically severed because it right. is, it's, it's like a, you know, you're sent to the principal's office type situation. And so just be ready to be prepared for that. I think that was another lesson I've learned along the way is like, not everyone's always going to be your friend. And in those instances, you're mm-hmm. guaranteeing they're not going to be your friend after that. Um, and that's, you know, just be, be warned that that will adjust the relationship for sure. Yeah. Yeah. I, I would agree. I would agree. I think once you, once you get the PIP or HR is involved in some way, the company is likely then going to be protecting itself depending on the situation and probably trying to get you out in some capacity Uh, but you never know some I mean you could come back from it but likely not and at that point you as an employee are probably already checked out anyway and the pip is just the thing that's going to push you even farther out so yeah okay so let's talk about growth because that's something that you've mentioned multiple times and kind of having that growth mindset as a manager but also with employees um, you know, how do you keep your employees growing in their position? What do you feel like is your responsibility as the manager versus their responsibility as the employee? Mm-hmm, yeah. So I've been lucky enough to work for a couple of different startups, which has created this natural ecosystem for growth accidentally. Like I mentioned seven years and like half a dozen, no, probably a dozen title changes at some point. <laughs> and And because we're building the plane as we fly it, and oftentimes it's all hands are on deck. You're not in one bucket of employee skills. You're not just CS. You're not just sales. You're not just marketing. You might be doing all of the above. And mm-hmm. so this allows for employees, myself and my past, to get a taste of a lot of different roles and sectors within the company. And I think this typically leads to highlighting skills and interests. Like somebody once told me, well, Meredith, you're a generalist. And I was like, I don't know what that is. Like, what is that? And they're like, well, you're really, you're really good at a lot of things. Just like, you don't go deep in one, you do everything like kind of, kind of okay. And and as a band director, same thing. I'm not a great musician. I can play all the instruments kind of okay. And I was like, okay. So, so then I start thinking about how, how, how and where are generalists in at companies? Like where, where do you see them uh, succeeding? And so that was kind of for me. Um, And then I also think it highlights interest for the employees. So like we go back to like the, the performance, the PIP thing. Well, maybe the employee is just in the wrong role. They actually want to have their, their dip their toe in in customer success versus sales. Like they don't like sales. It doesn't feel like a good fit. Um, So it allows for more exploration and responsibility when, when we work in these kind of growing, fast growing companies Um, and you're continually kind of testing and seeing where they're, they're happiest um, the manager role during all of this, I feel like you are, the manager should be the facilitator of the opportunities for them. You're going to be the one that's identifying, possibly identifying some of those strengths uh, and then leverage them. So one example would be a, a manager I had said, you're very pragmatic, Meredith. And I literally had to look it up. I didn't know what that meant at the time. And I was like, oh, like logical, like problem solving. Like, yeah, I get that. And he plugged me in, in the right spots for that. And Mm -hmm. like, he identified that. And I've always kind of tried to like, also, you know, kind of emulate that same way is like, you know, X person, you know, they're good at this and you have this project over here, you'll plug them in. And so I think that's kind of where um, the manager is almost like the conductor uh, of, of making sure people fit in the right, they're coming in on cue at the right times in the music. 
Um, right. And so, yeah, I, I think I'd also add that the two rules of leadership during that time, again, it's really important making sure that you're removing those barriers for them and then check in with them as they're feeling supported. And so any any time that they're in these growing roles, um, I think continually check-ins, pulse checks are really important because I think it, they can also go off on a tangent, which you don't intend. And you got to kind of like herd them back in and be like, okay, actually, let's maybe go over here and work on this instead of that crazy research project that you've spent tons of time on. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Okay. I, there so many things that I want to say because first, the generalist, uh, we've talked about this in, in previous episodes before. And generalists, if somebody identifies as that, it's so difficult for them usually to figure out their place because especially early in their career, because they're expected to just hone in on one thing, right? And then it's like, well, no, but I'm interested in this and I'm interested in that and I'm strategic and I'm a problem solver and I'm creative and this, that, and the other thing. And I think that's where uh, being part of a startup is actually a really great option. Little risky in, in most cases, but for a generalist, I think it is such a great place to be because if you go into, and I've advised people on this as well, if you go into like a large corporation with lots of structure and lots of layers and lots of rules and all of that, as a generalist creative, like you will, you will hate it. <laughs> you will absolutely hate it because you're not going to want to follow the rules. You're not going to want to follow the structure. You're going to see where things are falling apart and you can't do anything about it. Yep. You, yep. hundred percent. Yeah, so this is my plug. If you're a generalist, if you're feeling that way after after hearing Meredith talk about that, go work for a startup or a small business in a lot of cases is yep. usually um, the other environment that uh, allows you to kind of stretch and do do different things. So, oh my gosh, I love these. <laughs> yep. yep, I agree with you. <laughs> totally. Okay, one of the things that I like to do kind of at the end of the episode is give some advice and action items to people. I like them to be able to walk away with something really tangible. Obviously, we've talked about a lot, so I think there's a lot of tangible takeaways from this. But to kind of wrap it up, if you could give current employees any advice to be successful in their position or with their manager, what would that be? Yeah, it's kind of tough because I, I think for me, it, it's it depends on the relationship that that employee has with their manager. And there's so many different types of relationships and, and stages of, of where they're at. Uh, but I think personally, it's always served me best to be authentic and honest with my leaders and my managers. And I think being yourself and honest with your manager allows for more candid conversations. Uh, and I'm not gonna lie, I my you know I've told CEOs things that probably some people would be like, well, you said what? And it's like, but at that point, they they know who they're talking to, so they know it's a safe space. I've built that relationship with them, and so to be authentic in that situation was easy. Um, they might not have taken what I said, you know, and and changed the company structure or whatever, but it it's, it's, I felt like I could get it off my chest then. And like, okay, if this little thing in my back of my head is saying, well, I wish he'd do it X, Y, and Z. Well, he's not going to know to do it X, Y, and Z. If you don't say that you want him to do X, Y, and Z, and then have the, the, the conversation, um, continue. But I think, yeah, just try to be yourself, try to be honest and authentic. I, again, with the caveat of, I know not everyone's in in maybe a safe position to do that necessarily, but then I would say, maybe maybe find a position that you can be because you work, you know, eight hours of the day, at least eight hours of the day. That's a big portion of your life. You want to be yourself. Mm -hmm. You want to be that, that person that you woke up and looked in the mirror at and not pretend to be somebody else. So that's, that's what I would say. Yes. Meredith, thank you so much. This was such a wonderful interview. And I know that the audience is going to get a lot out of it. This was just such a great, great conversation. I'm going to make sure that people can connect with you on LinkedIn. So look for that in the blog notes for this episode. But thank you so much for being a guest. I really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. It's been awesome.